and everybody should get a little acknowledgement thing to say that yes, you know that it's being recorded. And so before we get started, are there any specific questions that you guys have regarding dive computers? So I can focus in on that when we get to those areas in the talk. And you can unmute, since we don't have that many people, you can unmute and, and answer at this point. But nobody has any questions about dive computers. Okay, that's a simple talk for me then. I've never used one. Never used one, okay. You need to unmute, Wendy. Uh, this is Rebecca. I'd just like to know what are some of the common mistakes you see divers use when they're using a dive computer? Okay, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that. Oh, you're um, unmuted, Wendy. Carl, I have a question for you about uh, um, the different uh, um, fat uh, saturation. The different what? Uh, your the different uh, saturation in your fat molecules. Okay. Well, when we talk about models, we can uh, bring that up. All right. So without any further ado, let's switch over to the presentation. Okay. Everybody, see the uh, the screen? Okay. And I'm just gonna bring up the, the chat window. I can see if the chat's connected. All right. So I'm gonna talk a bit about decompression theories, and models, and tables, and get into uh, dive computers after that. I forgot to add dive computers to this title slide. But um, like I said, if you have any questions, then uh, during the talk, use chat. After the talk, you can use raise your hand. And if you have any specific questions that you want uh, afterwards, you can always send me a, uh, a question. Uh, move this one to two. All right. Okay, so thing we're gonna talk about is decompression models, tables and computers, what they do and specifically what they don't do. And so when I got started at this in the early 80s, um, Decompression modeling, decompression theory sort of fascinated me. And at that time, in about the mid 80s, if you asked a question, how long can I stay at 100 feet without requiring decompression on the way up? You could get, question, you could get answers anywhere from 25 minutes using the US Navy tables all the way down to eight minutes using the US Navy probabilistic models. And so you have this wide range of responses based upon the underlying model. Let's see. Oops, here. So the question is, what are they all trying to do? So they all are trying to prevent decompression sickness which is the symptoms resulting from the evolution and growth of gas bubbles in the body following reduction in ambient pressure. Also known as the bands and originally defined as caissons disease back in the mid 1800s uh, when it was described in caisson workers and tunnel workers. So what happens? So you reduce pressure, gas comes out of solution and this gas bubble can cause obstruction in the joints, causing pain. You can get it in tendons, ligaments, and that sort of causes the pain type decompression sickness. But the other thing that happens is once the bubbles form, then you have a response of the body to um, the bubbles. And just like when you cut yourself, 
you'll start to bleed and then you'll get coagulation. The coagulation cascade starts because you have exposure of blood to gas. And so the same thing can happen in your bloodstream. You get bubbles forming and that causes coagulation, which then decreases the blood flow. And then the blood flow will then slow down. You get lack of oxygen. That causes tissue swelling, putting pressure on the blood vessels, reducing the blood flow further. You have thickening of the tissues between the, the blood vessels, increasing the distance gas has to diffuse. And so you've got this gas sitting there for longer periods of time, allowing more bubbles to form. And you can actually hear these bubbles following a dive. And even though people aren't showing symptoms, they still may be generating bubbles. And this is from somebody who is a recreational diver coming out of a recreational dive and no signs or symptoms of decompression sickness. And what we're listening to is a subclavian vein, blood flowing from the arm, and you'll hear these bubbles going by. And let me make sure I've got that sharing sound. Yep. So you hear these bubbles. And then he's going to make a shift. That's going to knock the bubbles off the side of the vessel so you can hear the shower of bubbles going on. Did I just knock myself out of that? I'm not sure what happened there, sorry. This is my first time at this, so sorry about that. And so what's happening with those bubbles, <clears throat> they hopefully are going through, going back to the heart, getting pumped out to the lungs and getting exhaled through the lungs. But if you've got anything like a PFO or some sort of AV shunt, you could actually arterialize some of those bubbles and actually end up with a uh, case of cerebral decompression sickness, which is about the only way you can get bubbles and decompression sickness to the brain. So this is what we're trying to prevent. We're trying to prevent this gas from coming out of solution, forming bubbles, and producing signs and symptoms. But there's this gray area between signs and symptoms and bubbles being produced, where you have people developing bubbles without showing signs and symptoms. Those are called silent bubbles or asymptomatic bubbles. And a lot of the decompression modeling now and the tests are being based upon the amount of bubbles that are being detected as opposed to actual signs and symptoms of decompression sickness. And so a couple of the terms we'll talk about. First one is saturation. Saturation is basically when the nitrogen gas dissolved in the tissues in the body is equal to the nitrogen pressure in the gas we're breathing. So we have no net gain or loss of nitrogen in the system. We breathe it in, we breathe it out, there'll be exchange of molecules, but the overall amount dissolved in the body will remain the same. So that's where we generally are at here at sea level if we haven't been diving for a while. And so as we increase the pressure, then we increase the pressure and the concentration or the pressure of the gas, the inert gas will increase and will start dissolving more into the tissues. And Henry's law says that if you double the pressure, then eventually you will double the amount of gas dissolved in the tissue. It's not going to be immediate, but it will eventually happen. And so as we dive down, we're breathing gas at a higher pressure, we're dissolving more and more nitrogen in our tissues, we start building up these 
um, levels of nitrogen that when we can come up could potentially form bubbles. So if we start at sea level, where we have 33 feet of seawater absolute pressure, and we'll say 79% of that is nitrogen, we've got a pressure of about 26 feet of seawater nitrogen dissolved in our bodies. If we go down to 80 feet, we're now at 113 feet absolute, or about 89 feet of seawater nitrogen pressure that we're breathing. And so we have this nitrogen gradient that will diffuse gas from in the lungs to the blood and the blood to the tissues. And the fast tissues are like the blood, which will build up nitrogen very rapidly. Slower tissues like the bone, bone marrow that have a very few amount of blood vessels going through them will absorb more slowly. And so it'll take a while to actually dissolve to a level of saturation. And so just to sort of graphically show this, if we assume our body is made up of tissues that are both fast and slow and everything in between, then if we start saturated at sea level and now go to two atmospheres or 33 feet, then the fast tissues are going to start building up nitrogen much more rapidly than the slower ones, but the longer we stay, the more nitrogen gets built up. And here at this point, our fast tissues are actually saturated, and then it'll still take a while for the whole body to become saturated. The amount of time it takes to be saturated is basically an operational time. So if you're dealing with saturation diving, the amount of time to saturate the body or desaturate the body could be up to 72 hours. If you're looking at recreational diving and some of the models there, if you look at the PADI tables, the PADI tables basically say that after six hours, you're either saturated or desaturated. So it depends on your operational constraints. And it doesn't have anything to do with any depth or tissue type, really. It has to do with what operations you're dealing with. And in terms of Chad's question about fat, lean versus fat, basically you're looking at the amount of molecules being able to be dissolved in those tissues, the fat tissues versus aqueous tissues. So you actually have more molecules, but the pressures you're dealing with are the same. And it may be because fat is not that well uh, vascularized. It is a slower tissue and will take longer to build up that amount of nitrogen. So it's going to be one of the one of the slower tissues here. So what happens when we start up? When we start up, hopefully what happens is the nitrogen diffuses from the tissue to the blood and gets washed out by the lungs. Uh, the fast tissues will off-gas the earliest, and as we go along, the slower ones will start to off-gas. So eventually you get to being saturated at sea level. And now you're starting out, you're, you're at the point where you started out, which is saturated at sea level pressure. But what's this green line? The green line is sea level pressure or 33 feet. So that means that the nitrogen pressure above that green line is at a higher pressure than the ambient pressure surrounding you. And the main force keeping bubbles from growing is that ambient pressure. So you have the potential of enough energy in those molecules to cause a bubble to start growing. And this area is called supersaturation. And that's where the nitrogen in the tissue, pressure of nitrogen in the tissue is greater than the total ambient pressure. So, in this situation here, these green tissues are fine because they're below the supersaturation threshold. There's not enough energy in the molecules of nitrogen in these tissues to cause any bubbles to grow. But in this section here, you've got enough 
energy in those molecules to cause bubbles to form and grow. Now, ambient pressure is one of the forces keeping them in check. The other one that's keeping them in check is surface tension. So if you have a very small, what's called a micronuclei, it's got a very high surface tension. So you actually have to have a pressure that exceeds ambient pressure plus the surface tension to cause nitrogen molecules to diffuse into this bubble and have it to start to grow. So at what point do we not become super saturated at all? Say we go down and dive to a specific depth and saturate. Say we spend 48 hours down at that depth and come up. Is there any depth we can dive to and not come up in a state of being supersaturated? And the answer is about nine feet. At about nine feet, the nitrogen pressure you're breathing in your tank equals about one atmosphere if you're breathing air. And therefore, anytime you're diving deeper than nine feet, some of the tissues in your body are gonna end up to the surface supersaturated. And so if you wanna look at a nice study that was done <clears throat> in the 90s, where they took and saturated people at various depths for 48 hours, you can see that at 20, little over 20 feet, most people had bubbles and about 20% had these what are called grade four bubbles, very high grade bubbles, and are about 10% associated with decompression sickness. So in 10% of the people who have grade four bubbles, you have decomp symptomatic decompression sickness. And so we have bubbles being formed even as shallow as 20 feet, although not you didn't see any symptomatic cases. 16 feet, same thing, you drop the percent of high grade bubbles down to about 16%, but you still had over 50% of the people showing some degree of bubbling. And even at the depth of a normal swimming pool or 12 feet, if you stayed there for 48 hours, 20% of the people still showed some level of mild bubbling. So, this nine foot limit is sort of this, this theoretical limit where you won't get any bubbling if you dove nine feet or shallower. But even in 12 feet after 48 hours, you had some people bubbling. So this means that we have some degree of what's called critical supersaturation that can be withstood by the body. And all this means is that you've got a certain amount of nitrogen pressure over and above ambient pressure that the tissues can withstand. And generally related as a ratio of nitrogen pressure in the tissue to the ambient pressure. And so the question is, what is that pressure? And this concept was put forth by Haldane back in the early 1900s, who said that if you are below this critical supersaturation ratio, bubbles will not form in the tissues, gas will diffuse into the blood and get washed out by the lungs. But if you exceed it, these bubbles will then form and grow and cause decompression sickness. So this is a good point to check and see if anybody has any questions. Don't see anything in chat. Everybody following okay? All right. So Haldane said, what is this ratio? What is this oh. critical? Yeah? Okay, this is Thomas. So uh, I had a question. Are there some tissues that are in the slower absorbing area that it's worse to get bubbles in than others or it, all bubbles are, are bad? Um, so in terms of like fatty tissues, uh, the myelin sheath around nerves, you don't want to have bubbles forming in there. If you get bubbles forming in your adipose, your gut adipose tissue, you're not really going to be doing that much damage there. 
but bone marrow is also very fatty. And so if you get fo bubbles formed in there, you can actually get areas of death in the bone marrow that can potentially later lead to what's called osteonecrosis. Um, so the big thing is if it forms in the um, nervous tissue, then you can have things, especially in the spinal cord, you could have um, spinal cord decompression sickness, potential paralysis, uh, other sorts of neurological deficits. If you got a bubble that forms just in the joint, in the muscle or tendon tissues, then that is not as serious, but it could, if left untreated, lead to some deficits. But the big thing is if you start seeing the symptoms of pain, you want to have that looked at and treated because the longer the bubbles remain, the higher the probability of this vicious cycle, the coagulation, the hypoxic injury, that could lead to more serious decompression sickness. Um, one of the things, if you look at populations, recreational divers, about 80% of the treated divers have neurological decompression sickness. If you look at commercial or military divers, 90% of them have pain only decompression sickness. And there's not that much physiological difference between the two just in terms of overall body. But what is different is operationally, military commercial diver comes up, they get an assessment if they have any aches or pains, they're thrown wide, right away in the chamber and are treated. And that clears up pretty fast. Recreational divers, they have an ache or pain in their joint. What are they gonna do? They're gonna take an Advil, drink some beer, wake up the next morning and maybe they get numbness and tingling and then they go see somebody. So it's sort of the operational constraints force the military and commercial divers to get treated sooner when you've got the more mild symptoms as opposed to letting it progress to more serious symptoms. Okay, so how did Haldane come up with his ratio? Well, what he did was to take goats. He put goats under pressure and saturated. He assumed goats would saturate in about three hours, put them under pressure, three hours brought them to the surface and observed for signs of decompression sickness. Uh, what he found was that goats exposed to two atmospheres or less came up with no signs or symptoms. So he said you could withstand a total pressure drop of two atmospheres to one atmosphere without any problem, or since the nitrogen pressure is about 0.79 of the gas you're breathing, 1.58 to one nitrogen to ambient ratio. So question is here, how do you know if a goat's bent? And you look at it, and here's one of Haldane's goats, and it's got a, a forelimb bend here. I, I should ask, can everybody see my little cursor moving? Okay. You see my arrow? Okay. Um, so this is what he was looking for. And if they saw signs like this, then that was too much of a supersaturation ratio and needed to go with a lower one. The next question was, can you withstand this same ratio going say from five atmospheres to two and a half atmospheres? And he did studies where he did that and the goats were able to withstand that pressure drop. And so with this, he was then able to start developing his model. And what he said was that you could say the body was made up of a wide spectrum of tissues that absorbed and eliminate nitrogen at different rates. And from the spectrum, he selected theoretical tissues or compartments that are just mathematical constructs. And these mathematical constructs had what was called a half time. So if you had a half time of five minutes, then after five minutes under pressure, that compartment would be halfway to being saturated, two half times for 10 minutes to be 75% of the way and so forth. And Haldane assumed after about four half times, you're about 94% saturated. So he assumed that you're saturated at that point. Nowadays, we're looking at about six half times, 
about 98% saturated. But this is just an exponential function. So he assumed exponential on gassing to a compartment and the same rate of exponential off gassing from that compartment. So symmetrical. And with that, he was able to develop a model, produced a set of tables, did tests on human subjects, took and created a set of tables that he then sent out to the British Admiralty. And the uh, occurrence of decompression sickness dropped greatly after the introduction of Haldane's tables. And that's sort of the very first set of tables developed specifically for divers. And since then, there have been a lot of different models, a lot of, a lot of different theories out there. Um, most recent Navy model, Navy started out using Haldane's model and then switched in the, 90, uh, in the late 1990s to a computer based on this model called the VVAL or an EL algorithm where it says nitrogen is absorbed exponentially and off-gassed linearly as programmed into the dive computer for the SEALs. And then this is what the basis of the new Navy table that came out in 2008 are. And it says you have exponential on-gassing like normal for Haldane. However, as opposed to Haldane, which is this is the, would be the off-gassing curve, you have a linear off-gassing that then switches over to exponential. And then depending on where you have the crossover between linear and exponential, you've got different rates of uh, holding on to the gas. So this linear off-gassing means that the compartment's holding on to the gas longer, which means you have more decompression you have to do and you have less repetitive time available to you. So there's all sorts of different types of models. The top one here is what's called a um, parallel model, which is the Haldane model, where you've got nitrogen being absorbed and eliminated from each compartment. Each compartment can hold a certain amount of supersaturation. You've got like a tissue slab, which is what the British use. You have a serial model where you have a, like a compartmentalized uh, slab model. And this is what the Canadians use. And then you start seeing more of these what are called two-phase bubble decompression models where you assume that a bubble has developed in the compartment and you calculate based on the assumption that the bubble is there, which is what the EL um, Navy model was. Uh, one of the more prevalent models that's out there is the one developed by Buhlman. It's a pure Haldanian model, gas absorbed exponentially and off-gassed exponentially in a series of compartments. And the reason why this is most prevalent is because it's being used in a lot of decompression programs and dive computers. And so if you hear Buhlman uh, ZHL-16 or whatever model, this is what it's based on. He's worked from the 1960s to the 1990s, basically, tuning this model until his death. And uh, like I said, it's used in quite a few of the dive computers and PC software models out there. Uh, the other thing that happened was in the mid 70s, there was the Doppler revolution where the bubbles we heard earlier, this is when the technique came out and people started looking at what happened when you exposed the a person to the Navy no decompression limits. And what they found um, was that if you took people to the limits, about 80% of the people developed the bubbles. And this is a lot of work was done by Spencer at the Institute of Applied Physiology and Medicine. And he then in 1976 revised the no decompression limits down so that you'd have bubbling occurring about 10 to 20% of the time. And these are the limits that are now being used by most of the recreational tables and dive computers, as opposed to the Navy that still is pushing out their limits for the most um, amount of time they can get on the first dive. And so what are we looking at? We're looking at bubbles. And 
this is what can what you can see with a imaging ultrasound and if you look at this is the right side of the heart right ventricle and right atrium and these little shadows here are bubbles coming through and notice that they're staying on that side and they're hopefully getting to the lungs and getting filtered out but in some people you do have what's called a pfo and this is actually from a pfo study to see if any of these bubbles cross over down here between the right and left atria and get onto the arterial side and if you do then you've got the potential of all these little microemboli that could cause cerebral decompression sickness so our goal is to try to keep the amount of bubbles that may occur to a minimum. And to do that, we have models, we have tables, and we also have dive computers. And so that's why Spencer's work and reducing the uh, no D limits was important because instead of having these bubbles occurring 80% of the time, now by dropping the no D limit anywhere from um, 50% of what originally occurred to 80% of originally uh, could do, you now had only about a 10 to 20% chance of developing bubbles. So the lower the chance of bubbling, the lower the chance of decompression sickness. Now, like I said, these limits were then utilized in recreational tables. Navy switched from, and now I switched from uh, the Navy tables to set of tables based on these limits. Patty had a table developed that was based on these limits. And these are also the limits I used in developing my tables back at the University of Michigan. So instead of a 60 for 60, or now the Navy says 60 for 63, we have a 60 for 50 minute, no decompression limit. And one of the things that has becoming more and more popular are these bubble models that say in the body you have these tiny little micronuclei, these nuclei caused by general movement, stress in the joints and so forth. And even though it's only recently coming into play in decompression modeling, it was actually proposed in the 1940s by Edmund Newton Harvey. And that he said, you've got a lot of very small micronuclei, a medium number of moderate size micronuclei and a small number of large micronuclei. And that you develop these large micronuclei, they'll shrink down into smaller and smaller sizes and may actually get stabilized by proteins. So what can you tell about a large bubble? A large bubble has a much lower surface tension, so you don't need as much supersaturation to cause it to grow. So if you've got a mild amount of supersaturation, you might cause that large micronuclei to go. If you increase the amount of supersaturation, you can start growing the moderate sized bubbles. And if you've got a high level of supersaturation, then you kick in all the small ones. So the amount of supersaturation will determine how many of these bubbles are basically activated and start growing into larger bubbles. And you can actually see these things. This is what happens when you pop your knuckle. You hear a pop, you create a negative space, and this is basically uh, scans of a knuckle and that you're popping the knuckle. You've got this sort of negative space here and then gas moves into it. So you've got this little gas bubble. And if you do this repeatedly, you end up with a series of little micronuclei, which is then could be the seeds for decompression sickness bubbles. And it's a lot more difficult to calculate than a simple exponential model that Haldane had. But the general concept is, is that you've got the nitrogen pressure in the bubble. And this is the ambient pressure plus the surface tension. And if the nitrogen pressure in the tissue is greater than that, you'll diffuse nitrogen into the bubble and the bubble will grow. When they're equal, it'll stop growing. And then as the nitrogen pressure in the surrounding tissue drops, then that bubble will start to sh shrink. 
And so this is one of the reasons why you give oxygen to somebody, even at the surface, because what you're doing is you're getting oxygen into these tissues and surrounding this bubble with a high oxygen environment, and that will help it cause, help cause it to shrink faster. And in using oxygen, this is our standard um, 165 foot dive in the chamber looking at a bubble model. And you can see that if we just use air throughout, and this is bubble growth in various compartments, that you get up to about a little less than three times the original size of the bubble. If however you put the person on oxygen at 10 feet, the bubble growth is severely limited. And here you're looking at three to four times the original bubble size showing symptom, symptoms of decompression sickness. So those are some of the things that are in the brains and in the guts of PC decompression programs and dive computers. So this is also a good point to stop and see if there's any specific questions that people might have. So you can actually unmute at this time if you want to and, and ask. Well, this is Thomas. I had a question. I think some of the advanced computers nowadays allows you to set some sort of safety level. I want to call it, you can set it to be conservative or you can set it to be uh, less right. conservative. Is that how, how conservative in general are all these things? Are they really, really conservative and, and setting it to a, uh, a lesser level doesn't really matter that much? Okay, yeah, that's one of the things I will touch on as we get through the dive computer section here. So, any other questions? All right, the concept of dive computers actually goes back to the 1950s when after World War II, they were trying to figure out how to control a free swimming scuba diver's decompression status, because up to then, up to World War II, everything had been hard hat diving and all decompression had been controlled at the surface. So there is actually a design for a diver carried pneumatic dive computer. And it was sent to a company called Foxborough and they actually put it together. And the idea was you had depth gauge and then you had this little window here and a disc underneath it. Half of it was white, a quarter of it was green a quarter of it was red. If green showed through, you could go up further. If any red showed through, you had to go back down. And you sort of rode it up so that all you saw was the white or green on the uh, display here. Well, they had problems with it. It leaked. It didn't match the model they wanted. And so it was sent back to the company and really never seen from again. So if it had gone through, the Navy may have gone with this type of device instead of developing the 1950 uh, Navy tables, which is what the recreational population picked up on in the 1950s. Uh, even though the Navy went with tables, it didn't stop other groups from trying to come up with ideas. This one's a SOS decompression meter, where as long as your needle here was in the surface area, you could ascend, if it got up to 10 foot, you had to stop at 10 foot till it dropped to the surface. And for those of you who are old enough, you may recall this used to be called the bendomatic. Because all it did, it just had a little resistor, a little ceramic resistor, a gas would come from a little bag here, flow through this resistor into a compartment that had basically a depth gauge. And so this was simulating nitrogen going into and out of your body. And so it really didn't work too well, but people developed systems for using it where it seemed to work for them. And so it wasn't really until the early 1980s when we started seeing the dive computer revolution, because at that point in time, you had the micro circuitry technology and low power consumption available to be able to put 
everything into a box that a diver could carry with them. And so this is where I got involved with dive computers, uh, with the development of the Edge dive computer, which had a 12 compartment model based on Spencer's no D limits. And then at about the same time, the Deco Brain came out, which had the Swiss tables in it, and then went to a Swiss model uh, the following year. So this is basically when things started. And I put the slide together 20 years afterwards, showing just the different models that came out that year in 2003. I gotta do another one for 2023 coming up soon. But as you can see, there are a lot of different dive computers out there. Not every dive computer has the same model in it. Even the ones that say they have the same model in it don't necessarily run the exact same model. So there is variation out there. Generally within a manufacturer, the model is consistent, but there's sometimes where it is not. You even have devices where you can get a pressure transducer that fits onto the outside of a housing. It's Bluetooth and it connects to your phone. You can take your phone down with you and have your phone be your dive computer. And you can, there are different models out there that you can download and run everything off your phone. So what is a dive computer? Main thing a dive computer is, it's a tool. It's just another piece of equipment to help with your diving decisions. So how do they work? You've got depth and time and sometimes other variables that come in. You then run the decompression model based upon this input. That information is then displayed to the diver. And then this is where it falls apart. That the diver uses the status as another piece of information to make decisions about the dive while understanding the limitations of the dive computer. The dive computer is not telling you what to do. The dive computer is telling you, based upon this underlying model and the profile that we just experienced, this is what my calculations come up to. Most people don't understand that and that there are limitations to what the dive computer knows. They're relatively simple. You've got Quick a pressure. Question. Yeah. This is Joe. What are the other variables that dive computers use other than depth and time? Uh, we uh, will get to that in just a few okay. slides. Obviously mix too, but okay, yeah. thank you. Um, so you've got a pressure transducer going to A to D converter, that goes to the microprocessor, you've got a timer that goes in, so that's how you get depth and time. Why do dive computers show temperature? Because there's a temperature transducer in there next to the pressure transducer in order to adjust it. So if you've got the data, why not show temperature? When you look at computer temperature, it's reading the computer temperature, not the water temperature until it gets equilibrated with the water. And so basically this is what the dive computer is. You couldn't have tank pressure going in and some of the dive computers will take tank pressure and based upon your rate of breathing, give you an estimated amount of time you have remaining on the gas supply. Some of them will take the rate at which you're breathing your gas and assume you're working hard if it's dropping rapidly and make adjustments to the model saying, okay, you're working hard, we're gonna reduce your limits. There's actually some out there that have heart monitors. So if your heart rate's going up, it's assuming you're working harder and will adjust your limits down. So there is some additional information some of the dive computers utilize. And the, generally simple. So these compartments we talked about are represented in the computer as registers and they will then have a value in it. You'll look at the ambient pressure, calculate the new value in these compartments compared to what's allowed at the surface, and then ask how much more time I can spend at this depth without exceeding this value. And so you get a no decompression limit for each of these and you display the shortest one. So that's basically what they do. And then they'll take this information, switch it over here, 
So every few seconds, they're doing these calculations. And even though it seems like it's continuous, it's still being done in incremental depth and incremental time um, because you're not able to do instantaneous calculations. You're doing it every few seconds. And the pressure transducer is only able to resolve a certain amount of pressure difference. But even so, if you've got a resolution of half a foot of seawater over a period of one minute and you're updating every three seconds, you have the possibility of resolving 400 different what we call square wave dives just down to one depth and up back up to the surface within that time frame and depth range. If you start going into multi-level dive, you've got up 20 to 20th profile. So there's a lot of capability, a lot of resolution that you have. Compare this to the Navy, no decompression limit, where you've got about 140 depth time entries that you would then have to pigeonhole your entry into. And as you remember, our 80 foot for 40 minute no D limit. So if you take a Navy model and program it into the computer, the same one that was used to generate that previous table, and you take this computer on a dive, go to 80 feet, and spend 35 minutes here, how much no decompression time do you think your dive computer would say you had available? And you may type this into your comment section. No, he wants to type it into your comment section. It's our first dive of the day. First dive of the day, yeah. How much time you have remaining? Okay, well. See that people don't want to commit. So I'll answer the question, which is five minutes. Navy square wave dive to 80 feet, you have 40 minutes. We're doing the same dive that the table is assuming. So we've got approximately five minutes remaining. Now, on the other hand, if you were to do this dive profile here, where you only hit 80 feet a couple times, but according to the tables, you have to assume you spent the whole time at 80 feet. If you did this profile here, then at this point here, 35 minutes in the dive, do you think you'd have quite a bit more time available? Yeah. About 135 minutes is what the model would tell you you had remaining. So, this is one of the biggest advantages of the dive computer. It keeps you within the model limits, but it's not restricting you to the table rules of maximum depth and tire bottom time. And so this is why you can use it on multi-level dives to get much longer diving out of a dive to 80 feet. And even though you're spending most of the time at shallower depths, if you're doing the tables, you'd only have 40 minutes, but if you're using a computer, you can spend more time shallow. And so with every advantage, there's a disadvantage. So advantage is you're not constrained by this entire maximum depth, entire bottom time rule. But that's also a disadvantage because by doing that, you're eliminating some of the built-in safety margins of the tables. Computers are using an actual depth of dive, so if you dive to 51 feet, you don't have to round up to 60 feet. But by not doing that, you're eliminating a safety buffer that's built into the tables. So you're integrating the dive profile, but by integrating the dive profile, if you're pushing the computer to the limit, you are pushing yourself to the limits of the model. And so, one of the advantages is that you can use the entire model in calculating your status, but by pushing the computer to limit, you're pushing the model to limit, and you have to ask yourself how much testing was done on that model. 
And if you go and check to see what kind of testing has been done on the various dive computer models, it has not been much. We did some testing with the edge computer at 119 person dives. And to date, as far as I know, that's the most testing, human subject testing ever done on by a dive computer manufacturer on the model that was programmed into it. So you have to realize that there's very limited human subject testing. And one of the things that sort of is the saving grace is most people are not pushing the dive computer to its absolute limit and therefore not actually testing that model in um, a field situation. Computers have good computational reliability, but there's always the potential of mechanical or electrical failure. You've got good accurate depth readings, much better than some of the analog depth gauges. Uh, ascent rate warnings, I think, probably have added quite a bit to diving so that people are slowing down their ascents. And in terms of treating somebody, the dive profile recording is great because we can pull it out of the dive computer and see what people have done. But diver needs to understand the limitations of the computer and you don't want it to become a crutch so that if you go on a trip and your dive computer fails, that you don't know what to do. You should have a way of backing into a set of tables and know how to use those tables. And one of the things I'm finding, especially trying to get crew members uh, here, is that dive table use and comprehension has dramatically dropped over the last 10 years. And most people are not, if they're exposed to tables in training, it's very briefly and then told to go to switch to computers. So you've got all these different dive computers with different models. How do they respond to the exact same profile? And one of the things we do is we work with uh, Scuba Diving Magazine on their dive computer tests, and sometimes they allow us to keep the computers and run our own profiles. And so this is a profile that Patty did when they were testing their tables, uh, three-level, multi-level dive. They had 19 people on this dive, two cases of very low-grade bubbles. So this is a very low-risk profile. So yeah, you take your goats with you. Who said that? <laughs> um, so what we would do is test and see what the computer said a minute before each of the ascents. So you can see at 130 feet, most of the computers were almost to the no D limit. Few had a couple minutes remaining, but then some had decompression requirements. So we had two that had seven minutes of required decompression. Come up to 70 feet, and you see that there's up to nine minutes of required decompression in these computers here. And up here, we had one computer that had 13 minutes of no decompression time still allowed. And finally, come up to 45 feet. And before surfacing, we have the, the Mari's M1 RGBM saying we have 15 minutes of required decompression time. And the Cochrane EMC 20H saying we had 26 minutes of no D time remaining. So which one of them is correct? The one that is correct is all of them. They are all following the underlying model. So which one would you want to follow? This one will give you so much more time, but we don't know whether that additional time will increase your risk of decompression sickness significantly. For that dive, are you gonna have 15 minutes of decompression? Do you have enough gas to finish that decompression? And so this is a relatively mild profile. So having some decompression would be okay, but is this a little extreme? Is this a little extreme? We don't know because we don't have the data. Now what's interesting is 
all the rest of these computers up here are what are called pelagic dive computers. They're made by the same company and they're private labeled to different uh, other companies. And theoretically, they have the same underlying decompression model. And even though they have <coughs> in their manual the same model listed, you can see that there is a difference in the response to these profiles. So realize that they would, may tweak their model from one year to another just because they may, may want to make it more conservative. So what you have to realize is that the dive computer has a limited view of the world. Most of them only understand depth and time. That's what they plug into the decompression model. However, there are some that will take a set rate. If you're going up too fast, we'll tweak the model so it reduces your limits. If it senses that you're cold, which means that it's cold, then you will have an adjustment made there. But temperature, like I said, you're only looking at the dive computer temperature. Physiologically, you could be colder in 80 degree water with a skin suit and somebody well insulated in a dry suit in Antarctica. And so until we really get the ones with the rectal probes, we won't have that information. Profile sequencing up and down, you know, what you see with um, instructors, that can influence your susceptibility. Some will take that into account. Breathing mixtures, you tell it what you're breathing, different levels of nitrox, it will adjust for that. Some will take breathing rate or heart rate and adjust to some sort of exertion level and adjust the model that way. And there's even one that will take your birth date and as you grow older, your no D limits will decrease. So there are some that will take those into account. Other things like physical conditioning, limb positioning. So if you bend, your arm like that, you are cutting off blood flow to the arm. So if you're holding on to something like this during decompression or holding on to something tightly, you are restricting flow and making you more susceptible in that arm. Uh, hydration levels, whether you've got this PFO we talked about, body composition, things that the dive computer don't know. So you need to take at least two computers with you. And the other one is at least your brain and a thought process as to what's going on. You have to realize that there are a whole lot of variables that influence your decompression safety. I love this chart that Neil Pollack put together because it shows you all sorts of things that can intersect that may make you more or less susceptible. And why don't we open it up for questions before we get into some of some of these? So anybody have any questions at this point? You go ahead and, and unmute. It's probably easier than doing the raising hand if you have a question. So if you're testing out the dive computers, um on people, like, are they actually testing the dive computer? The person goes down for the dive, comes up, and they're looking for the bubbles in their system? Um, or how, how is that done to see if so, they're really effective? So there are a couple ways. Number one is testing the limits of the model. So the way we did it here was we ran chamber dives where we ran the model to at least the limit of one of the compartments on each of the dives to see if we got any um, bubble formation. And we released it because we only had one very low bubble grade uh, in our study. The other way to test it is operationally, how are they used? And for that, Dan's Project Dive Safety took dive profiles from hundreds of thousands of dives to look and see if people had any symptoms later, and then went back to see if they could determine the risk associated with it. The big thing is, is that most people are not diving the computer, like I said earlier, to the limit. But the tests that we do, we just put them in the chamber and run them. We don't have people down with them 
but what we'll do is we'll run against profiles that have known outcomes, like the PADI test profile that had very mild um, bubbling, all the way up to a Canadian decompression study that had a very high incidence of bubbling and about 10% decompression sickness. And luckily, none of the computers allowed that profile, but that we can't really tell like in the one we did, if you went those extra 26 minutes, what the additional risk would be. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just very limited data. So I have a question. Oh. Can I your first time? Okay, yeah, so I had a question. The, the, the graph that you showed where some of the computers were giving you extra time and some of the computers were giving you far less time is that that is entirely dependent on what the dye profile was that you did the test for. So, right. A, a, several years ago, Prius was doing tests on how many gallons per mile they could get, or miles per gallon they could get, and they were using a test, and it turned out that that is really not a good measure. So, how do you know that you're using a a dye profile that is reasonable, and what would you expect? So, so yeah, this is one of about four standard ones that we utilize, all the way from this one, which had a very low risk, um, up to the higher risk one. And yes, the actual distribution of computers will change depending on the profile. So. When we're looking at, say, a decompression dive, uh, the Canadian one, which is the decompression dive, the edge, which is the one in the middle, actually cleared first, and others took longer to clear. So it will, like, like you said, it does depend on the profile, but this is the one that shows that there can be very, very large discrepancies between the different models. I'll just, this is Joe, I'll make a comment that I dive a lot to, uh, with friends where we do deep short dives because we do rig diving and the comparison of what our computers show us since we're doing similar profiles is hugely variable. And I dive with a very old computer that usually tells me I'm dead by the end of the day <laughs> and, and a more modern computer that basically shows me that as long as I don't go too far into deco, it, um, it forgives me. Often I will go out of deco just as I do a gentle ascent, although I don't think it has a, um, a uh, algorithm that does uh, safety stop at 60 feet like some of the, I think the Suntos do. Um, but actually my question is, is, is there any physiological evidence, not epidemiological, that's different, but physiological evidence of the safety of a safety stop either at 15 feet or 10 feet or whatever, or at 60 feet, or is this all kind of just patty making things easier because maybe it's just a good idea. I, I view it as a good idea with no scientific evidence really backing it, although there may be epidemiological evidence. So um, in terms of the deep stop, a lot of that is anecdotal. And if you look at the models, the concept has, in, in both, both the Haldanian and the bubble model, the concept of a deep stop, if you're going from one depth straight up to the surface or to your first deco or safety stop, it makes a little bit of sense to stop about halfway and just let those fast tissues off gas a bit more. Uh, but you don't want to spend there too much time there, just a short amount of time and then continue up. There have been studies or people that have said you can do these decompression dives where you force the first stop deeper and even to the point of you can shorten your decompression time overall by doing deep stops. That concept has not paid out from what I've seen. If you do a deep stop, your computer will take that into account in its calculations. If you're using tables, use that as when you end your bottom time, not when you left the bottom um, as you're coming up. So those are, those are some of the things to think about. In terms of the safety stop, 
the safety stop actually had a lot of data that came from studies done out here at the lab by Andy Pilmanis back in the, uh, the 1970s, where they looked at people diving to 100 feet, came straight up after the no D limit, and had a certain amount of bubbling. And then they had them do various stops at 10 feet. There's one where they did it 20 feet and 10 feet, and basically eliminated bubbles. So you're adding in these extra decompression stops, which is a safety stop is just a prophylactic decompression stop. And so there is data to support that. And at the Safe Ascent workshop that AUS had years ago, um, the recommendation that came out of it was a three to five minute stop between 10 and 30 feet. And that was the original recommendation for a safety stop. I don't know if that answered your question or not. It did. It, it tells me that there's more evidence than, than I was aware of because I didn't know about the study that you did out there. No, it wasn't me. It was my, one well, of my predecessors. Yeah. I had another question, but I can't remember what it is now. Okay. All right. Well, let's, let's sort of go over some of the things that may influence decompression. Oh, wait. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry. I did remember it. So being a rig diver, we often we're going for that elusive grouper that's down at 150 feet. And so you see it and you go down there and because you're narked or who knows what, you miss and think, damn it. And so then you head back up to uh, 100 feet, reload, go back down again. And so, there, you know, watching the computer, looking at everything, you know, really paying a lot of attention. So basically what people call bounce diving. Right. You know, but observing the one foot per second ascents, paying very close attention to what dive you're in of the day, et cetera. So, you know, we're not, I'm not a hell diver, let me put it that way, if you know what a hell diver is. Um, do you think that that's, is there an, an additional risk because of that profile versus say somebody who just goes to a hundred feet and spends an hour there or whatever? Um, the answer is yes, we'll go over in just a few minutes a study that was done on what's called yo-yo diving. Okay. Uh, the yo-yo diving that is in the study goes from depth to the surface multiple times. So it's probably not as severe doing uh, the yo-yoing back and forth at depth, but um, there's still probably some additional risk. Okay, just in terms of increasing susceptibility or decreasing susceptibility. One of the things that's always been proposed with nitrox is if you do the same dive you would do on air, but use nitrox, your decompression stress is less. And that's sort of a no brainer, but really nobody really did any study on this until um, a couple years ago, 2016, where they showed that people who do 36% nitrox versus air on the same profile and had some cycling going on in here, that the people on air had much higher bubble grades than the people who are on nitrox. So my concept of nitrox use is you use nitrox, but dive it as if you're diving air and just know what your PO2 limits are so you don't exceed that. So that's one way to reduce risk of decompression sickness or bubbling. Hydration, everybody says hydration is a good thing. So there's a nice study that came out um, about 2009 where they're looking at people who did prehydration and they ended up with lower bubble scores than the people who did not hydrate. And it was the same, same person on different weeks. So some people, there is no difference or very low difference, but overall, there was a significant improvement or decrease in bubble grades for the people who, um, who hydrated. This was uh, about 1.3 liters of, uh, in essence, uh, Gatorade 90 minutes before a dive. Uh, the yo-yo diving I mentioned earlier, a study with pigs looking at square wave dive to five atmospheres, and then back up. 
and here's your 10, 10 meters per minute or approximately 30, uh, 33 feet per minute. And doing two bounces to the surface before finally ascending and then four bounces to the surface. Doing the two bounces didn't have any significant differences, but going four times increases the risk of decompression sickness. And looking at bubble grades, you can see those who had four bounces had much higher bubble grades than those who had two or didn't have any bounce. So the concept here is by going down and coming up, you may be stimulating these little micronuclei and causing them to grow. So you're distributing your micronuclei population from smaller to larger and that making you more susceptible when you finally ascend. Temperature is a big one. And the Navy did a nice study um, in terms of temperature. And for all of their dives, they used 120 foot, 70 minute decompression schedule. So the same decompression schedule. This is all swimsuit, t-shirt. And so cold water was 80 degrees. And when you're talking 70 minutes in 80 degree water, that can get cold. Warm was 97 degrees. Reason they did this is because they had an increase, a very high risk, a high rate of decompression sickness in the divers working a plane crash off the East Coast where they were in hot water suits below and in decompression chambers on the surface, they were cold. And so <clears throat> they had where they were working warm, decompressing warm, working cold, decompressing cold, working warm, decompressing cold, working cold, decompressing warm. So best case scenario most people think about is warm, warm. And in this case, they had about 17% incidence of decompression sickness. So when the diver was warm at depth and warm during decompression, 17% incidence. They then said, if you're cold, then you bounce up to the next longer time. So in this case, they took it back to 60 minutes so that it, they would bounce up to a 70 foot schedule, 70 minute schedule. And cold at the bottom, cold during decompression was about 23%, 22, 23% incidence. <clears throat> the scenario that they were seeing in the field where they were warm at depth and cold during decompression, they cut their bottom time to 30 minutes and they had about 22% incidence of decompression sickness. 30 minute dive using a 70 minute schedule. They then dropped it down to 25 minutes and got it down to about 5%. Next thing was, let's go to cold at the bottom and warm during decompression. And so cold at the bottom, warm during decompression, no incidents at 30 minutes, no incidents at 50 minutes, took it to 70 minutes and only about a little over 1% incident of decompression sickness at 70 minutes. So what's happening is that when you're warm, you've got a lot of blood flow to your extremities. And then as you cool down, that blood flow shuts down. And so if you're warm at depth, accumulating gas and come up and you're cold and it shuts down the flow, you trap that gas longer. And so the important thing here is you wanna be cooler during your dive and warmer during your decompression phase because it has a very, very large impact on susceptibility. Another thing is exercise. Study looked at dry resting in the chamber, 100 foot for 60 minutes, and 40 minutes of decompression, no cases of decompression sickness. They added light work to this, and ended up having to more than double the amount of decompression time to get the same result. Moderate workload, they had to increase it even more. And then they actually had to stop the study when they had a serious case of decompression sickness following heavy workload. Because what's happening is you're working, you're getting 
more blood vessels opening up to the tissues, getting more gas into those tissues. And then when you stop working during decompression, during decompression, that flow drops down and you've now trapped that gas. So if working and exerting yourself at depth is bad, how about doing exercise while you're decompressioning? Being during decompression. And this is where mild exercise helps. Because what's happening is you're maintaining, by moving your limbs, moving your legs, you're maintaining the blood flow so you're not dropping the blood flow down and trapping gas in the tissues. And so this is a study looking at those people who are inactive, those people who were active, this is how long after the dive. And you can see those people who were inactive had much higher bubble grades than those people who were active. And so by having some level of activity during your safety stop or during your decompression stops, you're maintaining the blood flow to help wash the gas out. What about exercise before diving? Lots of information one way or the other on this, but interesting study looked at rats <coughs> who exercised prior to doing a dive. And this was basically seven atmospheres for 45 minutes brought to the surface. And this is the mean survival time. And the red are rats that didn't do any exercise at all. And then the others, the yellow and the uh, green are those who exercised 48 hours before, 20 hours before, 10, five hours and a half hour before. What you notice is those rats who exercised 20 hours before, all of them survived longer than an hour after this dive. And the concept is, is that by exercising, you actually create um, heat stress proteins and nitric oxide that can condition the lining of the blood vessels which then will reduce the potential for bubble formation in those areas. And in looking at the amount of bubbles they detected, you can see the amount of bubbles in the 20 hour rats was very close to zero. So you almost eliminated gas formation in these bubbles or in these rats. They did some studies on humans, not looking at uh, mean survival time, but looking at bubble grades after a dive to about 60 feet for 80 minutes. And those people who are sedentary, and these were the same people, they were their own controls. When they were sedentary, they had a much higher bubble grade than when they did exercise 24 hours before. And the exercise was just 40 minutes of three minutes at 90% heart rate, two minutes at 50% heart rate, <coughs> and eight cycles of that. There's a study looking at exercise two hours before diving and really wasn't much difference. There's a little bit of drop on those people who did a single bout of exercise running at an intensity of 60 to 80% of, of 45 minutes prior to the dive. So seems to be some benefit two hours before. At the same time, you have this study which looks at those people who had <coughs> exercised 24 hours before. Those people are exercised, oh, here it is, exercised 24 hours before, two hours before, and those who didn't exercise. And the ones that didn't exercise had lower bubble grades than the ones who exercised two hours and 24 hours before. And the big difference between these two, gr the groups we talked about previously, and this group was, this was looking at a cycle ergometer, where the other two were people running on a treadmill. So what's the difference between cycling and running on a treadmill? Vibrations. And so there's a study looking at putting people on a vibrating bed or platform 
And those people who did go on the vibrating platform, when they didn't do a flex, there really wasn't much um, difference. But when they flexed to drop bubbles off the side of the vessels, there was a significant difference. And so what you're looking at is possibly vibration knocking these micronuclei off the side of the blood vessels and making you less susceptible to decompression sickness or at least bubbling uh, in the blood. Uh, this was another study where they looked at oxygen breathing, vibration, and the combination. And what they found was you had the best situation when you had vibration prior to the dive but if you did oxygen and vibration, it didn't give you as much benefit. And they're still trying to figure out why that is. Okay, so we're getting close to the finish, which means we need to talk about saunas. And there's a study looking at saunas prior to diving because saunas can produce heat stress proteins that might um, condition the endothelial lining of the blood vessels. And what they showed is those people who had a sauna prior to the dive had fewer bubbles. And so with this type of information, we have a new decompression model that we put out called the shake and bake model. And then there's always chocolate. Wait, and I have to ask. Everybody gets in the sauna after the dive, not beforehand. Can you so tell us the, about that? So, so getting in a sauna after the dive, it will depend on who you talk to and what study you look at. Um, I did this growing up and in college after diving the quarry in Ohio, coming up to my parents' house and hopping in the sauna. And as far as I know, there was no negative effect to it. Uh, the, the big thing is, if you have super saturation in the tissues around the skin, you could possibly cause gas to come out of solution there. On the other hand, the heating will help the blood flow and that will help wash the gas out. So there's a sort of balance there that exists. We've got a hot tub on some of the dive boats out here. As far as I know, we haven't had any major increase of cases because of that. What about exercise post-diving? I'd rather have a beer and a nap, but it doesn't always so, work out that way. Well, we'll talk a little bit about that. I don't think there's any really good studies that I've seen about exercise following the dives, but there are some reasons why we want to avoid that for at least a couple hours after diving. And uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But much more important is, does chocolate have any impact? And the answer is no, unfortunately. There was actually a study that looked at good Belgian dark chocolate prior to a dive and it didn't impact um, bubble formation. So what does this all mean? It means there's no table or computer out there that's gonna be 100% effective in preventing decompression that there are all these different variables that you need to be aware of and use to reduce your decompression uh, risk. The body isn't just a simple mathematical equation. Is somebody beeping me? Oh, that's me. Um, that you can plug every single contingency into. So you have to realize that all these things are trying to do is give an envelope of depth time combinations that are hopefully safe for most of the people most of the time. But within that envelope, you'll still have some people who get into trouble. And yes, there'll be people who dive outside of that envelope and get away with it. And those generally are not the people you wanna be following. Uh, we talked about safety stops, do them. 
Number one, it helps reduce bubble formation, reduces decompression stress, and even on shallow dives, they help to slow down your ascents. How long will it take you to get from 15 feet to the surface following a safety stop? It should take you at least 30 seconds. And especially if you get close to your no delimits, that's when you really want to make sure you're doing these safety stops to reduce your decompression stress on surfacing. So activities. So hydration before and after the dive, make sure you've got good perfusion, good gas exchange. Heavy exertion before the dive, you've got the possibility of creating these micronuclei. Um, however, some of the stuff that we saw on vibration where maybe running might give you some protection. It's sort of six of one, half a dozen of other. During the dive, you don't want to be exercising that much because it increases your gas uptake. And after the dive, if you're exerting yourself heavily, you may be creating these micro bubbles and it's like throwing salt into soda. And you may you have a super saturated state and if you start putting little micronuclei into there, then they can start growing and cause problems. And so that's why I recommend at least two hours before you do any heavy exertion. Mild activity, just like at safety stops, will help wash out the gas. So following decompression, stay active, be mildly active to keep the blood flowing. Uh, we talked about holding on to things tightly or bending limbs. You want to avoid that so that you don't get gas trapped into <coughs> uh, the limbs because that will reduce your washout. And then somebody said they like a beer and a nap. Not good because your metabolic rate drops and you lower your gas washout uh, following a dive. So you just need to make sure that you acknowledge that there's risk involved, understand the limitations, don't push the computers to their limits, add safety factors whenever you can. Somebody asked about various safety factors. Um, depending on the computer and the model, you can drop your no D times down up to 10 minutes just by adding higher levels of safety factors. And then you get into gradient factors. That's a whole new different lecture um, in terms of that. Dive computer will not ward away bubble formation. It is just a device that's recording depth and time and giving you um, its output. And just most of all, Use common sense. You don't want to be like the person who was being treated who was asked, what type of computer were you wearing? And the only thing they knew about it was it was yellow. And then I'll throw up my advertisement for our chamber day. We have our big fundraiser coming up. If you want to participate, we got t-shirts we can send out and such, but I just wanted to throw that out there. And if you have any questions, go ahead. I'm going to stop my screen share here. And you can either raise your hand or since we got not many people, you can unmute and ask. So this is Thomas. I had uh, two questions. One was regarding the hydration study. That based on that graph, it looked as if there is no negative impact of hydration, but positive impact really is dependent on, on, the, on the diver. So what Correct. made those divers unique? Was there any study about the ones that saw a really, really important impact? No, not that I saw in that study. And so the other question I asked was regarding the temperature on decompression, like diving cold and decompressing warm and so forth. Right. That's a very interesting scientific study, but how would you use that practically for a recreational diver? What benefit would that be? So in terms of recreational divers, the big thing I would say is for those people who are moving towards active heating in their dry suits. So there are more and more heated underwear and other devices. So if you are 
going to use it, you want to use it sparingly at depth. So you might be slightly chilled at depth and then kick it in when you're decompressing. Um, thermoclines help us a lot because if you're in an area that has a thermocline, you're cooler at depth than you are um, and you heat up when you come up during your decompression. But um, yeah, it's something to think about. Primarily it gets you thinking about blood flow and making sure that if you're working those limbs, if you're cold, if you're warm, what's happening with your blood flow, how is gas getting in, how's gas getting out of those tissues. So uh, if no one else has a question, um, I carry a, a an 100% oxygen welding bottle. That's a long story, but we basically have 100% O2 hookah on my boat, which I have set to about 13 feet, which works out to be about 1.2 atmospheres partial pressure. Also, some places I dive, I carry a pony bottle with a 50-50 mix, and we'll, I have a computer that I can switch on the fly that will go up to 100% O2. But I also dive with a friend who's a a uh, hyperbaric doctor who is always telling me stories about people going in the chamber for a long time at 100% O2, you know, way above anything what the recreational limits are for nitrox, et cetera. And it sounds like nothing really ever bad happens. I guess my question is, is the 1.2 just overly conservative? Um, I like the 50-50 bottle. I switched it out at 30 feet or, or 35 feet and it's amazing how the deco goes down on my um, computer very quickly and my day is better. Again, that's just a computer. It's not right. telling me what's really going on the body. Can you just comment a little bit on that? Is that overly conservative? What's your, what's your thought about it? I've never heard of somebody going into to oxygen, you know, uh, uh, seizures or, you know, that sort of thing. So, Couple, couple points just on, on your protocol there. I would recommend that if you're programming these gases into your computers <laughs> that you knock down the uh, percentages a bit on the oxygen. So if you're using 50-50, you set it like you're breathing 40, just to add a bit of conservatism. Same thing if you're using pure O2, cut it down to maybe 90, just to, it'll add some decompression time, but you'll get some benefit by those gas switches, just so you're not pushing right. things right, right to the limit on your model. Uh, in terms of oxygen toxicity, ah. the thing you have to do, or the thing you have to be aware of, is that the limits are conservative, but they're conservative for a reason. And the main reason is variation in oxygen toxicity is great from one individual to another, and within an individual from day to day. And so you are, if you're trying to push your mix to hot mix, you are basically playing Russian roulette. Um, there have been cases, especially when, you know, te technical diving and nitrox first started coming out, people saying, well, this doesn't impact me and they end up drowning. There's cases of people switching to the wrong eco gas, switching their high O2 mix at depth, seizing, having a problem. The problem is these things can come on without warning and your general outcome is drowning if you have a seizure in the water, unless you got a full face mask. Uh, in the chamber, yes, you can withstand a higher amount of oxygen. We're running 2.8 atmospheres at 60 feet, but they are, number one, not immersed. Immersion increases susceptibility. They are not exerting themselves. Exercise increases susceptibility. And temperature-wise, they're relatively comfortable. So either too hot or too cold makes you more susceptible. And then the final point is, if they do have a seizure in the chamber, we can take the mask off and let it subside. So the downside is much less than the downside in the water. And even with that, we haven't seen any seizures in our chamber running at 60 feet, but there are clinical hyperbaric chambers that are running shallower depths. So 
so like 45 feet that because they're dealing with people who are have compromised sense systems they do see the occasional oxygen toxicity seizure in there so it's very variable and so one from a 1.2, 1.3, yeah. that's fine. 1.4 is fine. Um, if you start getting up to 1.6, you're now pushing sort of the limits. Maybe for their long-term exposure for their SEAL teams, I believe have dropped down to 1.2. Okay. And that's for longer term exposure. The main issue with my hookah is that the thermocline is often at 15 feet, which also relates to the current. So mm -hmm. being able to drop it a little bit deeper has its real advantage. You get more clarity so you can see the sharks swimming around, et cetera. <laughs> but but the, being evident. above the thermal is better decompression-wise. Yeah, well, true. But with, if the current is whipping you around and you're, you know, it's, it's a problem too, so yeah. thank you. And Chad, I apologize. I think, no, no, I, I am recording it. I had a feeling that I had not recorded it. No, you recorded it. That was great. Okay. Um, if nobody has any other questions, uh, Carl, thank you so much for your time. Um, I really, really appreciate it. Um, and thank you so much for recording this so we can share it with people that weren't able to make it today. Um, for all of the, uh, everybody that's not Carl, thank you so much for joining us tonight as well. Um, I'm hoping to do um, more of these. Um, I don't have anybody lined up quite yet for next week, but I'm working on it and I'm constantly sending invites out to people. So uh, I'm hoping to continue this. Um, well, I'm hoping to continue this for forever, but um, at least through while we're shut down. Um, so thank you. And thank you so much, Carl. Really, really awesome talk. Oh, thank you. This is fun. Thanks, Carl. I, I, need to work, I need to work on something so I can get visual feedback from you guys a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have the gallery view one? Yeah, I do, but I had other things that were covering it. So. <laughs> and then, then we have the people who put in their pictures instead of their face so I could see their face reactions. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my first meeting. I'm I'm prepared. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go and stop recording here. Thanks for your time tonight. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, guys.